Whiskey, Jason here. Whiskey from the viewpoint of an American in Germany tasting rare and exotic whiskeys. Today I have a doozy for you. Imperial 21-year-old. Ooh. Uh, this is actually from the guys who own the Whiskey Exchange. They have their own little <clears throat> distillery called the Elixia Distillery. It's more of an independent bottler at the moment. Maybe one day they might actually have a distillery. Um, the Element Series, Port Askic, um, and as well as this here. What they have is called the Scotch, the Single Malts of Scotland, a Marriage of Casks. So I actually like this box. Um, so unfortunately, there's no information here. I would have loved to have a little bit of information about this bottling. There's hardly any information about it whatsoever. The only thing we basically know, and that's because it's on some websites in German, um, is that there have been f five ex-bourbon casks, um, all um, distilled between the years 95 and 98. So I paid 229 um, euros for this bottle, which is the going price over here in your German. Germany, it's 47.5% uh, um, ABV, and it was bottled 2020. That's about it. Now, um, I've actually opened this bottle up once, and I can do it a second time. What you have here is almost like a booker. So you have a little piece of cloth that hangs down here, and you can pull it off here from the wax. And so you have a little strip, and then you can twist it, and you can actually open it, which is a fairly ingenious system um, using wax and using that little strip there. Um, if you've ever had something from Michel Couvert, um, they could use a system like that. So, Imperial, the distillery. If you've never heard of them, don't worry. Um, <laughs> it's a closed and or silent distillery, however you want to say it. Many people have said this has been the, um, <laughs> the jinxed distillery, actually, because in 1897, um, up until 1898, um, Thomas McKenzie, the guy we might know from single malt scotch whiskey history, he actually founded Dal Ewan. Uh, later on, he merged together, actually helped um, with Taliska, and then he built this distillery and then closed it one year later. So um, we had to wait until after World War One was over, 1919. The distillery actually then went back to life um, for a total of six years under the um, <laughs> the ownership of DCL. So DCL actually turned, I think, into Diageo later on. So it was mothballed for 30 years, and so 1955. This is the boom of the single malt. Uh, sorry, the Scotch whiskey um, of, of Scotch whiskey. Afterwards, you had a Scotch lock which was an overproduction period. So 1955 up until 1985, uh, they actually um, built their own Saladines and malting floors or malting facilities. 1964, they doubled the stills from two to four. Um, and then 1985 was mothballed. Um, there was just an overcapacity and they had to get rid of something. Imperial. So the good 30 years of the production time was where this actually worked. So 1989... Allied Vintage Distillers actually came along, bought it up. Um, they were later on bought up by Chavez Regal, 2005. Um, they actually used this for almost nine years. And exactly during that period, from 95 until 98, those five casts were distilled. Um, they had a once-in-a-lifetime 10-year-old um, after the distillery was closed. They actually put out the Allied um, Vintage Distillers, a 10-year-old bottling of Imperial. Other than that, it's only been um, independent bottlers that have bottled anything. So 2005, as I said, Chevis Brothers um, actually came, took over the site, and then they actually bulldozed everything. And they rebuilt something that I have that I've actually visited, the um, Dal Munak uh, Distillery. I was there. I drove through um, the space side there, and I was like, "Oh, look at that! Oh, wow! Oh, it was one of the one of the most breast, breathtaking distilleries in the whole area. From the design, from the architecture, from the stills you could see outside, it was mammoth." Um, and there was no distillery tours whatsoever allowed. Um, very, very disappointing, to be honest. Um, one of the uh, most modern distilleries in all of Scotland and no distilleries. Um, but that's on the site now of Imperial. So you'll never have another Imperial. So my tip of the day is if you're looking for something to invest in, put aside for five to ten years and pull back out and maybe go on a secondary market for it, try to buy something from Imperial. 
try to buy something from Imperial with maybe a limited a number of bottles, ta-da, which I still don't know how many. Um, try to find something with an age statement on it, ta-da, 21 years old. And um, just leave it set for a few years because the more people buy it, the less products out there and the more people would want to have it. So this is going to become more of a collector's item. It is already. Yeah, don't forget I paid 229 euros for this. Eh, let's say with the uh, the current exchange rate, way over $260. Um, is it worth it? We'll see. Uh, one last thing. I actually did a bottle share with this. This was gone very, very quickly. So it was basically... Um, Almost 20 euros for 5CL, so a little sample that looked basically um, like this. And it was 35 um, euros for a 10CL sample, which basically looked like this. That's a lot of money to pay for the opportunity to taste one of these whiskeys. But the question is, how often have you ever seen an Imperial offered? Either at a whiskey festival, a whiskey fair, at a bar... And now, have you ever had the chance? Uh, many people have one of these things that they want to do in their life is taste all the different distillers at least once. Um, I will br briefly or soon have a Brora that I'm going to try. Yay. Um, that's something that hasn't been on my list for a little while. Port Ellen I've had. Imperial I've now had as well. And if you have one of those things that you want to try all of the distilleries of Scotland at least once, um, you can't get around these old distilleries that have been closed as well. All right, it's given. right, I've given enough time here in the glass. The first time I smell it, it's like a very old, very nice grain whiskey. There's a little bit of a citrus, um, more of a lemon meringue, as well as vanilla moment. 47.5% um, ABV is probably not cast strength. Nowhere on here does it say anything about cast strength. Um, so I think they diluted it down to that, which is maybe not a bad idea, to be honest. More bottles, more profit, and maybe they actually figured this was a good price, a uh, good um, um, ABV point. I wouldn't say proof point, but we don't have proof over here in Europe. It's not a complex nose. Um, it's a little bit of honeysuckle. It's a little bit of a gooseberry moment. And you're getting a little bit, and it's probably more of a, um, I want to smell it, not that I really do, a more of a dusty type of old moment. 1995 is not that old. I mean, come on. I have a bottle in here from 1997. I can pull out other stuff here from 92 and so on. It's... It's not one of these rare things from the 60s or 70s or even 80s. This was produced from 95 to 97 or 98. So this is not that long ago, um, especially if you think about um, Scottish whiskey. Now, for American whiskey and for bourbons, yes, but for a uh, single malt scotch, a 21-year-old is nice. <laughs> but it's not exactly one of those, oh, I've never had one of those ever. So, um Let's try it. The nose is above average. Let's say that. Cheers. Mmm. Mmm. Wow. The first thing that impresses me is how well the alcohol is integrated. <clears throat> I really, really think they hit the optimal point here for the for the ABV. Well done, you guys. I'm getting grape jelly. I'm more of a very bright yellow type of grape jelly. I haven't told this story, I think, for like a year or so. I was in Hungary uh, in 2000. Was it 2000? It might have been, it actually might have been 95. Yes, my son was just born, so it was 95, 96. Let's say 96, um, 96, 97. And I was in this area called the Balaton, and it was a wine growing region. And uh, what they did have was grape juice. And they didn't have just the dark 
grape juice. Juice they had the light grape juice, the yellow type, which looked almost exactly like that. This was the best grape juice I've ever had in my life. And I'm getting a little bit of a moment of that grape juice. I'm getting honeysuckle. I'm getting gooseberries. Um, I'm getting a little bit of a of a peppermint, maybe more of a more of a spearmint to be exact. This is actually very, very, very nice. This is going to be a B whiskey in my book. Now, you can fight all you want about the price, 229 euros. Uh, but I barely think you're going to get anything much cheaper than that at the moment. I've looked. I found one bottle that was a little bit cheaper from a signatory in vintage bottling. Um, also from 97, I think, 96, 97. Um, I bought it. <laughs> I put it away, and I'm going to pull it out in five or ten years <laughs> and see what type of um, return on investment I can get for that. I don't do it very often. But every once in a while, I will find a bottle and go, ooh, that looks interesting for the future. And I'm fairly sure there's going to be market out there for that especially since it's signatory vintage. Now, Elixia Distillers, um, their Marriage Cast series is not yet um, as popular as signatory vintage, especially the signatory vintage that I have is a cast strength and it's in one of those vase bottles. It's beautiful. Um, it has a t- t- traditional label on it and so on. Um, that is actually, I think, a little bit more in the crosshairs of the um, collectors. Why did I open this up? Why did I buy it? Um, First of all, I bought it because it was like, oh, that was interesting. I have never had an Imperial before, and then I bought the other one. And second of all, I opened up because a fellow blogger of mine, he's called Whiskey Turntable, Peter. He did it, and he was very, very excited about this whiskey. He liked it. Afterwards, I said, I'm going to also open my end up and do a bottle share with it. He said, well, Jason, it's not that good. I said, well, too late. (laughs) Mm, 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 mm. There is no corn in here. It's 100% malted barley, but yet I get buttered corn. Not popcorn, corn, corn on the cob. The gooseberries kick in. The, um, the honeysickle kick in. There's a spearmint moment as well. There's a tiny little bit of a dusty moment that I kind of imagine. And the wood is very, very complimenting. It's not at all in the front, but much in the background supporting. And as I said, the alcohol is just perfectly, in my personal opinion, they hit my sweet spot, perfectly integrated. Very, very nicely done. This is for me a B whiskey. Wow. A, why haven't you bought it? B, buy it. C, you can buy it if you want to. D, uh, don't need it. And F, why was it even made? Um, value for money. <laughs> to be very honest, a 21-year-old whiskey like this should cost, in my opinion, between 120 and 150 euros. So you're paying basically between 100 and 100, 175 euros a premium for this name, Imperial. Silent distillery, closed distillery. It's going to be even more in the future, so get used to it. Um, Same thing happened. Remember remember looking back at the prices at Brora, not Brora, Port Ellen, when they first came out? It was like, no one wants this. And then now they're like five digits. (laughs) I can can sometimes find a Brora for uh, between three and 5,000 euros per bottle, and then they actually go up after that. Just unbelievable. Will this be the next um, Port Ellen? No. But will it be something that will probably increase in price and value in the future? Eh, I think so. We collectors, we hunter, we gatherers out there, we like to have things we can't get anymore, and that's going to be one of these. Is it a good drinking whiskey? Yes. Is it worth 229 euros? No. Am I happy I opened it up and tried it? Yes. All right. Well, gentlemen and ladies that are watching, thank you very much. My question of the day is, what um, imperial whiskey have you ever had in your glass and tried? And second of all, what other closed distilleries do you know of? 
So I'm going to mention something I already talked about, um, Brora, Port Ellen, and now Rosebank. Those are three that we talk about a lot. Um, then after that, maybe Imperial. Don't include any grain distilleries, no Cambus or anything else that has been closed, um, if you can avoid it. What other distilleries do you know out there that have been closed? Thank you very much for watching. Whiskey Jason here, Whiskey from the Viewpoint of an American in Germany tasting rare and exotic whiskeys. If you ever need to contact me, whiskeyjason at gmail.com. Otherwise, thank you very much for sharing this video, for liking, for subscribing, and telling others. Bye-bye.